Hey, good morning, guys. Uncle Craig here on the Bond Knock. Where now, as I come outside, I feel a little sprinkles. And it looks like a little bit of rain. It's kind of gray. You probably see that. It's been sunny for the last four or five days. And I uh, got a lot done on the shop. But if it starts raining, I don't think I'm going to be able to do much in there. But yeah. So, today I thought I would tell some stories of my island adventures. Why? Well, one, because I like telling stories. I used to always tell stories of my adventures when I would come back from traveling to my friends and family. Oftentimes they would say, dude, that never happened. That's not true. But it is true, and they are true. Because I would travel alone, and I don't know if I was just more you know, risky or whatever, but, you know, or even philosophical, you know, I would get into some stuff and it would make for some great memories. And so I thought I'd do a kind of a, just a limited series. You know, I had a series on my channel, Tales from the Hoodie, where I would share the story behind, hey cat, where I would share the stories behind my hoodie, and where I got it and why I kept it and what I remembered, you know, as a memory that was attached to it. Um, also did a short series um, on my 60 seconds over the rice paddies, you know, with like the Vietnam helicopter sounds. Those are pretty cool. But my series, I, I figured I would limit it to seven videos on the same topic. And that would be uh, most because seven's a lucky number. But I'm sure I have more stories than... Uh, just seven in my island adventures, but I figured I'd pick seven out to uh, highlight because uh, I really like some of the stories. And also, you know, I don't mind being able to have them recorded because, hey, one day I might not remember anything. I think I'm already losing my memory. So better to have a digital archive of it, put it on my terabyte drive. But I think, you're, you know, those portable hard drives, they only last... Uh, like 10 years or something like that. You need to record it again onto something else or whatever. Weird. At least that's what some of the data says. So we'll see. Anyway, uh, let me uh, set up my camera over here in my bamboo palace under construction. And I'll tell you a story about my first island adventures in Palau. All right, let's get back at it. Okay, so Palau, pretty beautiful place. If you saw that video clip, you know probably know why I went there. You know, I had an affinity towards islands early on. Had been to, well, now anyway, I've been to probably over 30 of them. I don't know why, probably just chasing the sun, I, I suppose. But early on, when I was traveling, you know, before iPads and iPhones and all that, before the digital era, um, you would go in the airport and there was always the store that basically had all the newspapers, right? And it also had all the magazines. And they're probably still out there now, but not like they were before. You'd have a wall, a couple walls full of magazines because you're traveling and people read. And one of the magazines that I always bought even buy it in town if i found it was islands magazine big bold letters across the top said islands and they usually highlighted an island or a group of islands uh in you know in the magazine but of course it had all kinds of other islands and uh palau was one of these islands that it had highlighted i especially liked islands magazine i think it's probably still in publication I especially liked it because in the back classified section they had islands for sale and just you know classified ad picture of the island uh, maybe not even a picture just a description and they were priced like some of them were only like twenty thousand dollars or whatever of course you know 
30, 40 years ago, that was that was a lot more money, but still $25,000, $20,000 for an island, you know, all the way up, of course, to hundreds of thousands or a million. But it just really depends on what the island had. Most islands like that, they're cheap, didn't have any infrastructure or nothing. They were just this, you know, just like a, an island in the middle of a lagoon, maybe, where it had stuff growing on it, no, nothing. You know, you could buy it, and it would be yours. But if you wanted to bring stuff to it and build on it, that was what was really gonna cost you. You know, solar wasn't a huge thing back then either. Uh, so that would have been even more costly. But you can probably do it today. Uh, most of the islands that you can buy today, you know, they might be standalone. They might have uh, a house and a little dock or something like that. Uh, some of them might be seasonal. So you would, you know, during a certain time of the year, they're underwater or the majority of it is underwater, so you can't really inhabit there. Um, but you can still buy islands today. Uh, and I've always entertained that idea. I was like, oh man, of course a long time ago, you know, 30, 40, 50 even years ago, I, <clears throat> I thought of buying an island, uh, but I didn't really have the concept of what it would take to live there and build infrastructure and the cost and all that stuff. Now I understand it and yeah, it's probably out of my reach. Anyway, <clears throat> Palau was one of these places where my adventures really stuck in my mind uh, in terms of like what happened to me and what I did and things like that. And I had first flown there on a small plane, I think back then it was Continental Air Micronesia. And you know, maybe 16 passenger it was probably a small plane that was contracted by Air Mike or whatever anyway I landed at the airport which was nothing of an airport and um, you know I always I never had reservations or any of that stuff I just jumped on a plane would go somewhere land and figure it out and uh, that was the adventure part right and um, <clears throat> When I landed, I was like, okay, wow, it's just massive, all jungle, all, you know, dirt roads and everything. And I'm like, where am I going to go? And there was one guy, he had an old, like an old army jeep that would, that he would rent, I guess. You know, he was like, yeah, rental. One jeep, like that was all they had or he had, you know, maybe he just drove his own jeep out when a plane would land and he would rent it. And so I rented the jeep. Uh, I don't know how long, but it was probably a few days for sure. And um, I drove around and I found these like little rooms, kind of like a long house with little rooms in it uh, on the road across the street from the beach. And it had like a market on the end of it. The guy probably owned the market, probably owned the little rooms or whatever. And um, I remember getting up early in the morning. I don't know if I got there late in the afternoon. I just ate and I, you know kind of cautious you know but I got up early and I walked across the street down to the where the beach was because it was like a, a dock you know it's like a cement slab that kind of went out for all the fishermen that would um, come in with their boats it's a very small dock almost like a personal dock you know it wasn't back then infrastructure wasn't super developed on Palau either so it was very small but I stood there or maybe I was sitting down on a rock just looking out, looking into the water and, you know, enjoying my my time. I'm like, yeah, I'm on Palau, you know, what am I going to do? Where should I go? And then a taxi guy, or a guy with a car that had a taxi uh, light on it or a sticker or something, he drove up and he parked on the dock too, across from me. And um, he got out and was looking at the water on that side and he, and he cracked a beer. And it was like 6 in the morning, you know, 6, not even 6.30, it was after 6, I think, but still very early. And uh, sun maybe just came up already. And I was like, yeah, beer, beer 30. And then, you know, after a few minutes or whatever, we happened to cross eyes or whatever. I was like, hey, what's up? You know, he's like, what's up? And he's like, hey, you want a beer, you know? And, um, I mean, he didn't say, hey, you want a beer? He held up his beer and kind of was like, beer? You know, I was like, yeah, sure. You know, I wanted to be hospi hospitable. So 
he gave me a beer and you know Craig Jones, we stood there talking and he, where are you from you know oh I'm from California and a couple of conversations and he goes do you smoke he goes smoke smoke I'm like uh, yeah I mean I think I was probably smoking pot back then so he busted out from his car um, like half a joint it was, it was super big it was like a fatty like a cigar and he lit it up and he's like blah, 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 you know hot boxing it and smoke and I'm like oh my god this is this is killer pot and so I, I only took like one or two hits and I could already tell that I was gonna be blasted and so you know I finished my beer and but then I I really was feeling like dude I'm I'm too buzzed right now I can't be hanging out and so I told the guy, hey bro, gotta go, you know, I got stuff to do, but hey, thanks for the beer, and I'll see you later, or whatever like that. He said, okay, my friend, you know, see you later. And um, I walked back across the street to my room, and I remember go going in my room and just kind of curling up in my bed and hanging on for the ride, because I, I, was, I was buzzing for sure. Um, just went back to sleep, and then uh, I woke up, and when I woke up, I was like, whoa, that was, uh, okay, I gotta, I gotta regroup here. It was still early, you know, it was probably 10 o'clock or something like that. I just got a few hours of sleep. And then um, I came out in front of the, in front of the, my room, it was just right there, you know, like a bunch of gravel on the front or whatever, dirt road. And, um, and I was kind of stretching and I looked over to my right to where the store was and, um, the entrance to the store or whatever and this girl this Palauan girl stepped out of the doorway she you know later I would find out she worked in the store so her family or whatever so she stepped out onto the out of the doorway and she was gorgeous I mean she had hair all the way down to like I don't know her ankles or something it was just long beautiful hair and she was beautiful and then uh I was looking at her because the wind was blowing a little bit from I think from the back so her hair was kind of going like this and I was going wow man that, that girl is beautiful I'm gonna marry her <laughs> and uh, and then uh, when I was looking at her she turned and she looked at me and she smiled had a big old smile you know and I was like uh, hi and then when she turned back I saw her kind of lean back a little bit and then she leaned forward and kind of just went and all I saw from where I was was just this fire just massive fireball coming out of her mouth just I swear to God I freaked I was like what the hell was that I even went back into my room going what did I just see and um, I thought maybe because I had been smoking you know ganja but uh, it was massive, massive, and uh, I was like, "Whoa!" Later, I would find out, of course, um, that was my first introduction, I think, to betel nut. So, if you're not familiar with betel nut, you know, uh, a betel nut palm has uh, these really nuts inside of the uh, nuts or whatever that grow on the betel nut palm, and you crack it open. It's got a red center, and then uh, they'll put it often put it in a lime or uh, put kind of wet lime on it, pinch some wet lime on it, wrap it in a um, hot pepper leaf, and then sometimes maybe break off the end of a cigarette and stick it in there with tobacco and roll it up and stick it in your mouth and chew it, basically kind of like chewing tobacco. Super stringent and, and results in a lot of spit. And that spit is very red, I mean like a deep red. So what this girl had done, basically, I think she might even use her hand or something like and you know, so it squirts out away from her. But when it squirted out, the, the kind of wind caught it into a mist and the sun was just right there off the horizon at 10 o'clock coming straight in there. And, the, and the, sun, the way the sun hit it and the amount of volume it was, was just this massive glowing red uh, cloud that had come out of her mouth. And I was like, holy moly, I had no idea. Uh, but later I would come find out it was beetle nut, and I think, but but not when I was. I don't even know if I found out when I was on Palau. I, 
probably found out that much later and was like, oh, that's that girl in Palau had Bilna. But that was some crazy stuff. And so I, I, um, you know, I, anyway, I got myself together and I got my Jeep and I took off to go explore the island. And as you can probably see from that other video, you know, it's a bunch of different little islands, from rock islands of Palau, also another place where they go dive and this and that. But if you're driving a Jeep, you might go across these little bridges or something uh, to get to other parts. And I went to, I wanted to go to like a higher point on the main island of Karor, I think, which was kind of like a mountain up there. And so I drove all the way up and I was going, the roads getting narrower and it's four wheel drive definitely, but the Jeep was fine. And I got all the way up to the top and it was a dead end of course, but I was able to look out and oh, this is really cool. But now it was actually by dusk. And so, uh, you know, sun started going down. So I, oh, I better get out of here. You know, it's nothing but jungle, pure jungle. Back now it's probably more developed, maybe in the roads better, but, but it was massive, very old uh, jungle, old growth. And um, so I'm coming down the road and you know it's kind of narrow and I'm going slow or whatever. And I come around the corner and out of nowhere there's this Palau guy standing right in the middle of the road. And, like I practically almost hit the guy. And uh, I was like, what? And so, and he was just looking at me and he had a, a milk jug in his hand and it had some white liquid in it, but it wasn't milk. And, uh, and he was like, and I, I didn't know what he was doing. He was trying to get, I couldn't go around him. So then he's like, you know, like, you know, waving like, yo, yo. I could see he was obviously uh, hammered. <laughs> and so he came over to the pastor's side and he's all uh, speaking Palawan. And I don't know what he's saying. He's trying to talk to me. And, uh, you know, I think he broke, had a little bit of broken English. But he's telling me, basically, after a back and forth and back and forth, I figured out what he was really saying was, dude, uh, you got to give me a ride down this mountain to my friend's house because we're having a party and I was like I'll get in man so got him in and um, and we were driving and he's like hey and he give me the bottle like hey you know you, you drink you drink I'm like no I'm good I'm good he's all no 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 you know so I didn't want to like be offensive or anything or be offend offend him you know and so I was like yeah okay you know so I took the bottle and I Put it up to my mouth and I took a, I didn't take a swig, I just kind of let it splash against my mouth because I didn't really know what it was. And um, and then brought it back down my, yeah, and, and all I remember is it smelled really bad. I was like, oh my God, but it was also, you know, it, it was, I knew it was alcohol of some kind. And it smelled really bad, I was like, whoa. Later to, to understand that it was actually tuba, which was alcohol, you know, might even call it rot gut whiskey in the states or something but made from um, fermented roots of I think the taro plant um, later I would actually have another tuba story I'll say that one but uh, anyway I actually wound up taking a couple more and I did take some a couple of drinks but you know after after just a couple of drinks you don't smell it anymore so Anyway, so we got down all the way and I started seeing houses. I was like, oh, I feel a little better, you know, because I was just with this guy I don't know. He's, he's hammered and I'm in the middle of the jungle. And so we get to this place where the houses are, you know, wood houses or whatever. And um, a lot of the houses in Palau are on stilts, uh, you know, probably for keep the jungle away from you. Uh, but anyway, we pull up in front of this kind of opening where the house property would be. I figured it would probably be a bunch of plowing guys drinking beers or whatever. And um, I was just going to drop them off. And he's like, no, 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 you come, you come, you come. And so I was like, well, maybe I'll just go in and say hi to everybody. Yeah, okay, you know, and then leave. Because uh, again, now, you know, it's, it's even a little bit darker. It's not 100% dark, but it's, it's dark. And so I walk in there and I see like, there's like 50, 60 people. I'm like, whoa, all kinds of people. On this side over here, there's a couple like palapalas or, or you know, uh, sala and um, bamboo. And there's all the men are sitting underneath here, really. And then on that side over there in the corner um, of the property is a big, long pala. And there's all the women are sitting over there. And, you know, everybody's talking, yak, yak, yak. And, and, but I noticed right away, most people are like old people, older people. And um, I'm like, wow, what's going on, you know? 
and then over here on this side was like a, a long house that was a hut you know it was enclosed and they're preparing food or something in there whatever I didn't know what was going on and so the old man had taken me when I came walking in he came up and he took me by the by the wrists whatever and walked me over and sat him sat me with him and all these other older guys I wasn't old I was a young young man and so but anyway I sat down the guy that I brought he just disappeared into wherever uh, and so I was like hey what's going on and then I turned around behind me were like these three big ass uh, pots like cauldrons almost I would call them and they're boiling you know super super hot fire underneath and and uh, I, I don't know what was cooking in there I just hoped that it wasn't gonna be me uh, you know in some kind of sacrifice you know I didn't I didn't know Palawan culture I didn't know any one of the custom practices were or anything like that and so I sat there I'm like yeah and after you know just after about five or ten minutes I'm like that all of a sudden I, I didn't see any little kids but then all of a sudden a bunch of little kids came literally kind of came out of the jungle it seemed like and they had plates of food and they were giving all the women you know setting down plates of food serving the women all these plates of food then they came over and they served us all these plates of food and I remember at one point I don't know if I took a picture back then I had a regular camera um, and uh, I had a plate of food and I swear it had like 13 14 different things on the plate uh, you know taro and of course meat and chicken and I mean, just about everything you could imagine and even more stuff I didn't know about was on that plate I'm like whoa and I'm like hey man free food so I was eating and enjoying and there were there was a, a group of men that were playing uh, you know instruments wooden instruments beating a drum and you know and kind of traditional island music it was really cool and everything and then as the tempo of the music got up more there was kind of st people started getting up and walking around. the ladies started moving around I'm like what's going on what's going on this is the part where I die <laughs> and so uh, but from the long hut out of the long hut came a Palawan woman uh, she was in a grass skirt and basically nothing else um, she was uh, covered in like yellow liquid like it was like a, a ginger or something she was just covered in this yellow liquid she had her arm one arm underneath her uh, breasts like holding them up and another her other arm was holding flowers and her had a bouquet of flowers in her hand and uh, she had a flower mark I'll call it uh, you know on her head and these girls kind of helped her out of that house and they walked her to the middle of like where we were all you know in the in the dirt area right there walked her to the middle of that and then I, I don't know if I talked or asked or whatever but of course I would later come to understand that this woman had just given birth in that house and this was like her birthing ceremony or whatever and uh, and she stood there because she and she looked like she just gave birth too. She was uh, like <laughs> hanging on, and all the old women came out. And they were all dancing around her, and they had like um, I don't know if it was you know grass or some long grass, and there and it kind of had the oil or the the ginger, the yellow liquid or whatever it was. I can't remember. And they were kind of like wiping her feet with it brushing her feet like cleaning her or whatever I, I think and um and then this really old lady like probably the oldest one in the whole group came over to me during the music and the dancing and took me by the hand and I'm, i can't say no right and so she took me all the way into where the woman was and and to dance with everybody to dance around the woman also so I'm like, yeah, you know, doing the old white guy thing. <laughs> and um, and she's like wiping my feet with the stuff and everything. And, and we danced around and I kind, of, I kind of made a couple laps and then I kind of came back to where I was sitting. And I was like, yeah, and they're all like, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was just a surreal kind of experience. And, um, and then the guy turns to the cauldrons and he's like scoops out what is really this huge white ball and it was really just the glutinous fat of a pig's neck like in a sticky ball and then put it on a plate and like air and gave it to me and it was also salty 
And so I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, you just, just eat it. You know, I'm like, well, okay. And I just kind of stuck it to my fingers and was like, um, okay. I'm not sure what that dish is or whatever, or if I'm supposed to add it to something, but it was wicked. I didn't eat the whole thing. I just tried to taste it. Oh, this, this is great, but you, you, know, you can have the rest. <laughs> and, um, but it was an amazing experience, amazing experience. I really did initially, I, you know, very apprehensive. I didn't know what was going on. I mean, you know, three big pots behind me. Could have been bones boiling in there for all I know. And then this woman was out here. She had a baby. Do they, do they make sacrifices here, you know? I mean, everything was going through my head as a young uh, lad. But it turned out to be just a, just a beautiful experience. And... Um, and then I, so, but I had, it was really getting dark and some of the older women and stuff started to leave and stuff. And the hardcore guys, younger guys, a bunch of young guys showed up, you know, hardcore drinkers and stuff. And I was like, ah, I probably shouldn't be here for this. And so I was like, all right, you guys, you know, gotta go. And so I got in my Jeep and I took off and uh, probably went and got something to eat or whatever, I think, or maybe not, cause I probably ate there. And then, and then, um, you know, the next day I had gotten up and I remember going to the beach. I mean, everybody wants to go to the beach anyway, right? These, the beaches weren't like big, long sand, right? There's just a lot of little sand areas around different rocks that you can call beaches. And there was this one that was kind of like a, what do you call it? A, uh, like an inlet area. So it had this couple of like pieces of sand that were fingers that where you could go out and kick it, it might have been a couple of trees and there was a, a Palauan lady and her daughter maybe 10 years old or nine years old so that were kicking back and the daughter was playing in the water right there and um, you know I, I, I saw them because I was on, on the one across from it and then I had my mask and snorkel and I was just kind of, the water's only about this deep, whatever, but I was floating, you know, just looking at the bottom and doing stuff. And then, uh, and then I had floated across where they were and then I was walking, had to walk past them to get around back, you know, to my Jeep. And, um, and when I was walking up toward them, the woman stood up and she's like, you know, kind of waving me over and I'm like, yeah, hi. And then she's, and then again she wasn't speaking any English but um, and neither was a little girl I don't even think she spoke but the gist of it was I could tell because she was pointing so the little girl had lost a ring in the sand in the tide water right there when she was playing or whatever and uh, she saw that I had a mask and so she asked me can you look for the ring in the water I'm like sure you know so um, I went down in there and I was looking and looking. I probably looked for like 20 minutes or something, but I couldn't find it. So I was like, hey, you know, sorry, whatever, I can't find it. She's like, all right, no problem, no problem. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, she didn't say no problem, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, she just was like, you know, thank you. And so they left actually. And, and I actually had, I think I had food with me and I was just eating with her, hanging out. And, uh, and I was thinking about that little girl. She looked sad, you know, so I was like, yeah, bummer. And then, um, and then uh, you know, thinking more about it, I thought, wait a minute, you know what? I'll try something. So what I do is I found a piece of like, like old baling wire or something was on the, in the sand. I took the wire and I basically wrapped it into a ring, like around my finger. And then I took it and I chucked it in the water, right? Kind of where, you know, they were talking about. And then I waited for a couple, three or four minutes, whatever, and then I went over there. I was still on the sand, but I stuck my head down in the water with my mask to look to see if I could see that metal ring. And, um, and I could see it, but I could also see that it had moved because of the current that goes in and out of that, that little, you know, area right there between the, water, the two, you know, fingers or whatever. And so, um, I watched it, I got out of the water and I go back, I watched it for probably another 20 minutes or so. And then I saw what had happened was that the ring actually pushed down the shoreline to like there was a shell or a piece of coral or something like that. And it basically kind of hit up in there because uh, it was like an eddy where the current would go around it, but bigger debris would run into it and be caught by it as it went around. So I 
snorkeled over there, you know, with my mask. I didn't really need my snorkel, but I went over there with my mask, just held my breath. I reached down there and I kind of roughed up the shells and all that area with my hand, my fingers. And uh, sure enough, I found the ring, uh, that little girl. It was, it was actually lighter, I think, than the one I made of metal, but it was, um, it was in there and I was like, oh my gosh. So I you know, kind of just jumped up from the water and I'm looking like, hey, where's, where, where's the, where, where'd you go? And of course they were gone by now. I was like, dang, man. And I thought, what should I do? And I thought, you know, maybe I'll, I'll you know, uh, find a piece of string, I'll tie it to the tree here and you know, she'll come and get it later. Or the, maybe if they come back, they'll know. And I thought, nah, I'm just gonna else take it. And so anyway, I, I remember I picked, a, I think it was a plumeria leaf or maybe the flower, yeah. The, I took the flower and I put the ring in it and folded it up. And then, and then I took the leaf and folded it up and I, you know, stuck it in my, in my uh, trunks, in the pocket of my trunks, swim trunks. And then basically forgot about it for a couple of days. And then I was walking along the beach um, after snorkeling somewhere or whatever, and there was like a, another, you know, pala pala or a bamboo hut outside and a community kind of place. And there was a party going on, barbecue or something. I could smell the barbecue, that's what I remember. And um, a bunch of people and had music going, you know, plowing music. Uh, very cool. I think it might even had karaoke going and somebody singing. But um, it was very cool, and I was kind of walking. I was walking kind of slow, and then out of the corner of my eye, I saw what was really this little kid came kind of run. I thought he was gonna run in front of me, but ran on you know about halfway and stopped. And then when I looked, I saw it was actually that little girl, that same little girl who had lost the ring. But I didn't put two and two together. Um, and then um, and she just stood stood there and was like looking at me, you know. And I was looking. I go, oh, like that, you know. And then, um, and then I started to walk away, you know, started to continue walking. And then I went, oh, and I felt my hand, my pocket, uh, cause my trunks were, I had my trunks on and it was still there. I was like, oh shoot, I got a ring. And so I turned around and I, I started walking a little faster towards the girl. And, um, and as I did that, um, then the mom came walking out to get the girl or whatever. I mean, they probably didn't know who I was. I mean, I would think, but then the mom recognized me and she's like, oh, hello. And I go, no, hey, I, I have, I, I, you know, I was holding up my plumera uh, leaf, uh, basically a leaf, so they couldn't see the ring or whatever. But I was like, hey, this, this is for you, this is for you. And she's like, what, you know? I'm like, oh, no, no, no. And I, and I tried to undo it, like, you know, and I'm like, you know, the ring, the ring. And she's all like that. And so then um, she pushed the little girl, like, towards me and the little girl kind of ran over and I was like, yeah, here. And I gave her the ring and she was big old smile and everything. And then she ran back to her mom. She's like, it's this guy, you know, and they were talking and plowing stuff. And the mom's like, oh, you have to come now. You know, you, you come, you come, you come. And basically, all right. So we went up into the barbecue or, you know, into the party. And, uh, and the mom started speaking really loud and plow and basically she's telling the story. And then this guy found the ring on and they're all going, oh my God, oh my God. And the, the, couple of the old ladies really old ladies were like walked up and they were like oh taking my hand you know thank you thank you and it turns out that it was a birthday party really for that little girl and the ring was an early birthday present from the grandmother or great grandmother um, that was hers where it was like an heirloom or whatever so for them it was this surreal experience of the, the re recapturing of this of this ring and then uh, for me, it was just like, oh, I'm so glad I could do that, you know. And uh, but I sat there again, bringing me all kinds of food, and and you know, and I think might even had beers, maybe light beer back then or something. <laughs> and uh, but it was a great time. I sat there and you know, and uh, listened to the music, hung out and stuff. Didn't understand a word most everybody's saying. There were a few people that did speak English, um, you know. I mean. People, English is probably the second, the, the second most popular language in Palau. Right now, they probably all speak English, but there's definitely a Palauan language that older people would speak. Um, the young kids were like always, "Hey, where are you from? You know, where are you from? Oh yeah, thank you. And you drink. Let's go." 
you know, you know basic communication kind of language. But anyway, it was, it was an amazing, amazing time, and uh, I'll never forget it because uh, it was just awesome. And that whole experience as a young man would be the kind of the catalyst for me to continue to go back to Palau. I was fortunate enough to go back there again for you know for a vacation and also for work uh, as I was an educator in the Pacific I also I think I was on an accreditation team once and we went to accredit the Palau High School where I met the you know the the vice president of Palau at the time I think it's Tommy gave me one of those challenge coins you know friendship circle pretty cool experience uh, as an adult just going back there is very different by then, you know, they had bars and cars and uh, roads and stuff like that. So it was a little bit different of an experience, but uh, you still loved it. You could literally walk out into any part of the water and go snorkeling. Massive turtles and manta rays. And, you know, if you've never watched uh, National Geographic, I think they also did documentary, uh, even in the early days, on the jellyfish lake that's out there. You know where you can swim in the lake with you know massive jellyfish all around you but because they're in a freshwater i think it's a freshwater lake um, they never developed the defense mechanism of the stinging tentacles so that's why you're able to be with the jellyfish but if you've never been to islands in the pacific palau is one of those places where you definitely want to go to because it, there's just an endless amount of opportunity to look and see and do I mean one of the things I also enjoyed was uh, stories and I wouldn't be surprised if there's a storyboard about that little girl experience out there now but uh, Palau people often would carve stories into a board or even a massive board I think there's probably I think there's a massive storyboard in the archives of America like given to a president or something like that um, but I know I bought more than one storyboard and uh, when I would visit Palau and, and it's popular among islands different islands would have different carvings of storyboards maybe the story was in a tree trunk or maybe it was on a flat piece of wood or a log or or whatever but there was a lot of it and uh, those are really really cool and uh, some of them are quite expensive and I'm sure they're in museums and things like that too anyway that was my uh, memorable adventures from the island of Palau hopefully I'll be able to go back there one day hopefully you will too well I hope you enjoyed that so that's the first in the series of seven about my island adventures next stop Tahiti. Alright, back at you.